made a couple speculative videos on the future of humanity, specifically on our settlement of the solar system and space more broadly. It's a fascinating topic, and so is alternate history. So in this video, I'm combining the two. This video is a culmination of my previous projects, taking a look at a potential future of humanity. In all my alternate history scenarios, there is a point of divergence, something that changes in order for the timeline to branch off. In this video there is as well, although rather than it being me going back and making change in history, it's me going forward and setting some parameters for the future. These parameters aren't set in stone, the future may play out differently or similarly. But the premise is basically this, fully reusable rockets developed by SpaceX and others bring down the cost of launching things into Earth orbit drastically. This completely changes what is possible in space, suddenly we have massive and much more affordable space stations, space telescopes and so on. The geopolitical landscape on Earth in the near future is multipolar. The United States and West remain prominent, but China, eventually India, and a handful of other developing countries become relevant regional or world powers. This combined with fully reusable rocket technology reignites competition in space, at first just to one up the other, but with time because the world's powers realize reaching a certain goal will become a major geopolitical advantage. And that goal is our last premise. The world's powers will strive towards reaching self-sufficiency in space, likely the moon first, reason being that self-sufficiency in space will give them a massive advantage in a future where the solar system is a competitive playground. The number one hurdle with colonizing the solar system, even with fully reusable rockets, is the insane amount of energy it takes to get something from the surface of the Earth and into orbit. It's what makes the notion of setting up dozens of colonies across the solar system seem ridiculous right now, even if it isn't necessarily. As soon as you're out of Earth's gravity well, it's really a piece of cake. I have a figure here to help illustrate that point. Pause and read if you want some more information. But essentially, delta V is a measure of the energy cost of going somewhere in space. With that in mind, this list shows the cost of different trips in the solar system. And as you can see, apart from Mercury, most places in the solar system are extremely cheap, assuming you are already in space. But leaving Earth, by contrast, is very expensive. So how to get rid of this cost and make solar system colonization trivial? Establish infrastructure in space so you don't have to launch anything from Earth. That's what I mean by self-sufficiency in space. Once a world power has a base on the moon capable of mining resources and constructing rockets locally, it can easily and at very little expense launch whatever it wants to anywhere in the solar system. Weapon systems, space stations, satellites, asteroid mining rigs, you name it. Payloads can suddenly be much bigger and require a much smaller rocket. None of this infrastructure will be serving Earth directly. Mining an asteroid and bringing it to Earth makes very little sense when we can just mine here on Earth. But mining the moon and using the resources locally makes a whole lot of sense. It's just a very big initial investment, and that's why a multipolar world is necessary. Countries need the threat of some other country setting up space infrastructure before them in order to have the motivation to do it first themselves. So this massive shift in human history can only happen during a multipolar era. This scenario begins right now essentially. In the coming years, after several failed attempts, SpaceX succeeds in developing their fully reusable Starship vehicle. Then in the latter half of the 2020s, the Artemis II and Artemis III missions take place. American astronauts fly by the moon and then land on the moon for the first time since the 1970s. At the same time, the Lunar Gateway Space Station is assembled in lunar orbit, and the ramifications of the US's newly developed fully reusable rockets really start to set in. A whole lot of previously impossible projects can be realized. Plans to build an outpost on the lunar surface set in motion as astronauts from the Artemis missions discover mineable ice deposits on the south pole of the moon. All the while, back on Earth, geopolitical shifts are in the making. China has become a clear geopolitical rival to the United States and invests a ton in its space program in order to become competitive. By the early to mid-2030s, it too develops a fully reusable rocket system similar to Starship and announces its plans to build a joint outpost on the moon alongside Russia and its limited but growing number of allies. India's growth also starts to make it more of a player, somewhat mirroring China in the late 2000s and early 2010s. It's playing catch-up, but considering how much it has been developing its space program already in 2024, it's on the right track. At this point, India and China would undoubtedly be considered relevant powers in the world, and the rising stars of the world we would be keeping an eye on at this point would be places like Indonesia and Southeast Asia broadly, as they eventually start to get their act together. As this multipolar world starts taking shape, ties strengthen in Europe. It won't develop into a formal federation, at least not yet. But seeing the world become more multipolar, Europeans would quickly realize they are not very relevant on their own anymore. While the EU remains a loose confederation of sorts, the European Space Agency is how Europe will make its mark on the world in this new age where space is the new competitive playground. 
At first, European space endeavors are in close cooperation with the United States, but the groundwork is laid for more independent space ventures in the future, as the direction the world is heading towards becomes clear. The 2030s and 2040s are a big turning point for humanity, as several powers are setting up lunar bases in an attempt to first achieve self-sufficiency from Earth, the old Outer Space Treaty really has to be revised. The great powers of the time write a new Outer Space Treaty, which lays down the rules to play by going forward. There really isn't a need to entirely carve up the moon like we have Earth. Only regions that could realistically become self-sufficient at this point are near ice deposits. If you're the first to set up a base by an ice deposit, you have a claim to said ice deposit and the land above it. But it will be a while before lunar claims involve a whole lot more than just dots on a map. Outside of those bases and ice deposits, the moon remains international waters. This is likely also when we'll see the first manned missions to Mars and celestial bodies other than the moon. At first, simply for geopolitical brownie points, but with time, also to look for good locations for future settlements, places with ice deposits close to the surface. Back on Earth, the world is changing slowly but drastically. While today we have useful AI tools like Dolly and ChatGPT, by the 2040s the true implications of the development of more advanced AI tools start to become very clear. More straightforward physical jobs are for the most part automated. There only needs to be a handful of employees to oversee things. More simple office jobs become extremely automated to a point where anyone can fairly quickly develop a website or make an eye-catching poster for their new company in a matter of seconds through AI tools. It's a gradual process, but with time humans go from being the primary money makers in an economy to only really having to oversee mostly automated processes. This will eventually turn our current economic models on their head and countries will react in different ways. A fairly straightforward solution in free market economies in the West could be to introduce universal basic income. Jobs still exist, money still makes sense for now, but there aren't enough jobs, so government could guarantee some minimum standard of living to the general population by just giving them enough money for food and housing. But long term, that's really just a band-aid solution. The concept of work may transform, allowing people to engage in activities by choice rather than necessity, fostering a post-scarcity society. There will be a tumultuous transition period, and some places do turn into cyberpunk-esque dystopias for some time. But others find new ways of running and organizing a society that actually make life a whole lot more enjoyable. Another world-changing innovation during this time is anti-aging treatments. At first, treatments that slow down the aging process, and eventually a complete cure for genetic aging. This technology does not just prevent all death, it simply prevents genetic aging, extending lifespans drastically. This has massive implications, especially in aging societies that could perhaps be spared a population collapse. Back on the moon, colonies eventually achieve self-sufficiency, kickstarting our settlement of the solar system. As this happens, the need for a governing body or agreement specific to space territories becomes apparent. This leads to the formation of a lunar council inspired by the United Nations, overseeing the allocation of resources and conflict resolution on the moon. With the moon serving as a proving ground for off-Earth living, humanity begins to eye other celestial bodies. Mars, asteroids, and other moons within the solar system attract attention for their mineral resources. The development of self-sufficient colonies fosters the creation of interplanetary trade, with the goods and resources being exchanged between Earth, the Moon, Mars, and other settlements. By 2100, there are several world powers, among them the North American Union, European Union, China, India, and Indonesia. Africa at this time would also be on the rise. While still struggling with poverty, their slowly modernizing economies are making them increasingly relevant in the world. The North American Union, inspired by the European Union, formed in the latter half of the 21st century after decades of increased economic interdependence and cooperation, and is not entirely US dominated, rather a pretty balanced union. Canada throughout the 21st century saw immense growth, tripling its population, and growing to a point where it would be relevant in the balanced union with the US. The American economic model also gradually moved away from old Reaganomics, adopting social democratic policies eroding a lot of the barriers and reasons for Canadians not having favored unification between the two earlier. With help from the US, Mexico eventually got a handle on its cartel problem and had completely modernized by the middle of the century. With a wealthy Mexico, Americans moving south of the border became very common due to the weather and relatively low housing costs. So with time, the US-Mexican border region became much less well-defined culturally. This along with many other factors made closer relations look increasingly appealing. The North American Union started off as an economic union and gradually moved towards something more like the EU. An interesting factor to take into account in this future world is the curing of aging and its effects on population. Life expectancy no longer really makes sense as a figure. Because of this, the population in North America grew a lot more than real-world predictions. 
but as birth rates collapse globally in tandem with anti-aging medicine being introduced, populations will level off and remain roughly the same throughout the 22nd century. Europe is in a similar situation to the United States, having introduced anti-aging medication very early on in order to prevent population collapse. Notable, like in the US, are also its growing megalopolises. Hyperurbanization is resulting in a handful of super densely populated corridors dominating human life, with large swaths of land relatively empty, growing natural habitats, as cultivated foods grown in factories replaces traditional farming. Just outside of the EU are also its associate states, which have varying degrees of cooperation with the Union. These include Turkey, Ukraine, and Belarus. Ukraine and Belarus faced tumultuous early century as Russia under Putin tried desperately to regain their former glory. The war in Ukraine ended in a stalemate similar to the Korean War, but the front lines became a status quo border and eventually demilitarized zone. Belarus went through a similar process. Following Lukashenko, Russia tried to install a puppet government, but at the same time a popular revolution took place in Minsk. This led to Russia invading just before Putin's death. When he died, this triggered a power struggle in Russia, halting their military advance. Another strong central figure supported by China came to power in Russia, blaming the nation's troubles and wars on Putin, and quickly entering peace talks, settling the Belarus conflict along the front lines. Russia didn't collapse, but faced yet another period of uncertainty, where several outlying territories slipped from Moscow's grasp. Most notably, the Major General of the 11th Corps in Kaliningrad didn't accept the new leadership, establishing military control over the region. Military rule in Kaliningrad wouldn't survive for long, however, due to local unrest, and the small rump state after decades of independence joined the European Union. China, like the US and Europe, introduced anti-aging medication, thwarting the worst of its population collapse. It did experience a significant contraction in population, but it leveled off just below a billion as anti-aging treatments were introduced. China today is one of the world's most powerful countries, with an economy comparable to that of North America and Europe. As you may have noticed, Territories in the east of Russia, like Kaliningrad, and several smaller republics formed break-off states during Russia's transitional period after Putin. The government in Moscow, busy keeping the west of the country together, never managed to recapture the regions. These far eastern republics eventually allowed in Chinese migrants to help with their dwindling populations, and slowly but surely became majority Han Chinese throughout the 2050s, 2060s, and 2070s. Their annexation into China was peaceful and supported by the Han Chinese locals. Mongolia, meanwhile, was a less complicated process, as the American world order collapsed and turned into a more multipolar world where the West of course still remained prominent, China slowly pressured Mongolia to integrate more and more with the Chinese economic sphere, gradually turning it into a Chinese territory by 2100. India saw immense population growth throughout the 21st century, and has only leveled off recently. Its problematic population growth was a major push in the settlement of the moon and solar system, as countless Indians left for new opportunities. This means a whole lot of people across the solar system have some Indian ancestry, even if they're English speakers in an American or European colony. India in 2100 is a modernized country. It hasn't quite caught up to China and the West in terms of standards of living, but almost. India also expanded in the latter half of the 21st century as Bangladesh, facing severe flooding due to climate change and in desperate need of economic assistance, voted to join India. It would not have been a popular move half a century earlier, but the rapid decline in strict interpretations of religion eroded the divide between Hindu and Muslim Bengalis. That combined with the rapid growth of India made unification all the more lucrative an option. Taking a broader look, a century later as humanity has been expanding into the solar system even more, the Earth-Luna system consists of one intergovernmental organization, which functions as a confederation of sorts. The General Assembly in New York City functions as a parliament, although the UN does have very limited control, with powers being devolved and spread among member nations on Earth, as well as the Moon and countless space stations like the largest located at L4 and L5. The United Nations also has outposts across the solar system, but populations in space never get close to numbers on Earth. Here the whole planet is a perfect habitat, whereas on Mars or Titan, habitats have to be constructed. But their political organizations would detach themselves from the UN with time, becoming their own civilizations. Each planetary system develops their own independent intergovernmental organizations and federations, as it makes little sense to be beholden to Earth politics a whole world away. Mars, for example, mirrors Earth a lot due to it being a relatively large planet able to sustain itself, and where habitats don't require nearly as much engineering due to the planet's gravity being sufficient, becoming essentially one massive desert nation with several large states, although it never becomes as relevant to human civilization as Earth. Further out, things look very different from Earth and Mars. 
A lot of people probably have this linear view of the solar system, with the asteroid belt being this cohesive thing and the outer planets being close together. But in reality, the distances are ridiculously vast. The asteroid belt is just a bunch of asteroids and smaller rocks, each with interplanetary distances between them. So there isn't a belt or society, rather thousands of stations and settlements completely independent from one another, living off of local resources and solar system trade. Further out, the outer planetary systems are each their own little worlds. The Jupiter system hosts one collective civilization, mostly based around Callisto and to a lesser extent Ganymede, as Callisto is the only large moon outside of Jupiter's radiation belt, and Ganymede is just on the outer edge of it and has a weak magnetic field. But Io and Europa can't really host larger settlements, simply due to how costly a craft you would need to construct to send people there if you want to protect them from the radiation. The Saturn system, on the other hand, is relatively safe. Saturn lacks the same massive radiation belt, with only the smaller inner moons being unfit for human habitation. Saturn's moons are, however, much smaller, with one notable exception. So similar to Jupiter, it consists of one major settled world, Titan, where most of the population lives, supported by the resources from all over the Saturn system. Titan is where people have the most Earth-like experience outside of Earth and Mars. Here people can go outside and experience a thick atmosphere, methane rain and lakes, although they obviously still need protective suits due to the extreme cold and lack of oxygen. As we zoom out again, the distances become more and more ridiculous. The ice giants of Uranus and Neptune indeed support human civilizations based around their major moons, but they're very small. There just never was the same massive push for colonization here, due to how far away and isolated they are. The situation is much the same in the Kuiper Belt. As we make advances in space travel we can barely imagine today, maybe super advanced 1G drives like in the Expanse, it's still ridiculously far away. As of 2200, there are temporarily inhabited self-governing science outposts on Pluto and Charon, but not much else. Other Kuiper Belt objects have been visited, but have no permanent bases or settlements. Human civilization in this world is mostly centered around Earth, and probably always will be. We'll create new civilizations on the relatively reachable solar system, going as far out as the ice giants. But beyond that, it will probably be like Antarctica and the real world, outposts where people only go to work temporarily. And this is the situation humanity will be in for quite some time. There won't be a massive push to colonize the Kuiper Belt and beyond. Only gradually, civilization will spread from dwarf planet to dwarf planet, simply due to the absurd distances. At some point, you'll just see civilization wherever you go in the solar system. It won't be cohesive or organized, there'll just be some self-governing settlement of humans or whatever we turn into as we advance, and some self-sustaining, self-replicating mining infrastructure on every major object as you look around. But that's about all for now. Don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and subscribe to see more content like this in the future. Also, a big thank you to all my channel members. See you next time.